gonna read some of a post I wrote on Facebook about the word of God or Elohim. Uh, a lot of people just call it the word of God, so I'm just gonna use that phrase here um, so you know what I'm talking about. And a lot of people try to say that the Bible is the word of God. And so that's what this post was refuting. Uh, I'm going to read from the post now and then I'll discuss uh, some more scriptures afterwards. The word of God came to Ezekiel before the Old Testament was ever written, seeing as how he had to write down what was said. Ezekiel 1 verse 1. Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year and the fourth month and the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chabar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's uh, captivity, the word of Yahweh came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river of Chabar, and the hand of Yahweh was there upon him. Ezekiel 2 verse 1 And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day, for they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh. Notice in Ezekiel 2, Yahweh speaks to Ezekiel through the Spirit. And the Spirit entered into me here, and he spake unto me. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is how we can hear the Word of God. Also note that not all of the scroll was Ezekiel scroll of Ezekiel is the Word of God, seeing as how Ezekiel is explaining more than just what he was told to say, but also explaining what he saw too, leading up to before the Spirit entered him. Furthermore, the verse 3 in Ezekiel 1 was not written by Ezekiel, but by a third party. You can tell because Ezekiel is speaking in first person, then verse 3 shifts to third person, and then it shifts back to first person in verse 4. Someone added the line to the scroll, The word of Yahweh came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Uzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar, and the hand of Yahweh was there upon him. Because as you can see in verse 1, he says, I, that's first person. And then verse 2, it talks about Ezekiel, that's third person, and the word him, that's third person. Ezekiel um, then picks up and says uh, first person again after that. So you can see that somebody added in a line there. In the same way, they have added to many verses and many scrolls and added letters written by a false apostle, right next to the letters written by true apostles. And then they tell you that it's all jiving with each other. But it contradicts about things like whether or not Yahweh wanted sacrifices and whether or not we should eat meat sacrificed to idols, and whether or not we are saved by grace alone through faith or if we need works to back it up. The Antichrist Church got its hands in creating the Bible, and that's why we have so many denominations today. People say the Bible is the living Word of God, when in reality it is the Holy Spirit, the seed of God, that lives inside of you that is the living Word of God. If you listen to it convicting you, you can hear him speaking to you. He's letting you know that that's wrong and not to do it. That's how he speaks to you. But many people worship a dead tree a dead idol, in the form of paper that men have added to and subtracted from and changed the definitions when they do different translations, um, as we were warned that they would in Revelation. And I said, wonder why the Catholic Church didn't want you to ever read that book, Revelation. They didn't want it in the Bible. For those who say our Father wanted to make sure that we got all the books in our Bible, I'm adding the books that were mentioned in the Bible, but they didn't get put in there. There are a number of books mentioned in the Bible that are not in the Bible. Now, I'm not going to read all these books um, 
I'll leave the post below. So, yeah, um, the Word of God is not the Bible. The Bible is paper that came from a tree, and Yahweh always said we should not worship dead idols. And many people have turned the Bible into a dead idol, a tree, basically. And some men added some words to it, and that's what they worship. They don't actually listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you know, you should check into this verse. There's something that's not quite right about that. Or, you know, they don't let the scriptures um, convict them. They, they want to, they read what they want to read, basically. So, as I said, Ezekiel had the word of God come to him when the Spirit entered into him. And we have the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. That's what happens. That's how we get anointed. The scriptures say that God anointed Yehoshua with the Holy Spirit and with power in the same way he's anointed us with the Holy Spirit and with power. And that's inside of us. But we're also told that in the last days, people would have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And you can see that when they say that they can't stop sinning. They don't listen to the Holy Spirit that's trying to convict them and get them holy that is set apart from the world. The only way to be holy or set apart from the world is to actually stop sinning. That's how you get set apart from the world. That's how you know the difference um, from somebody who is born of Elohim. That's why I say the Holy Spirit is probably the seed of him because it talks about those who have the seed of Elohim doth not commit sin. So it's that Holy Spirit that's convicting you that would cause you to not sin. All right, from Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is a living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and exposed before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, I know this is in Hebrews, and, um, you know, I don't, Quite trust Hebrews anymore. So I looked up some cross references. On Proverbs uh, chapter 5, verse 4, well, I'll start at 3. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold of shale. So, you know, the adulteress is basically representing sin when you are engaged in adultery you're in sin and you would end up dead because the wages of sin is death but the point here is it's smoother than oil is her speech and in the end she's you know sharp as a two-edged sword so the double-edged sword is connected to speech and this is in proverbs so this is not like a new idea that speaking is related to a double-edged sword Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. Yahweh hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. And the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. And his quiver hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with Yahweh and my work with my God. And now saith Yahweh that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of Yahweh that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. And then it goes into the restoration of Israel, which I spoke about earlier in my videos. 
um, such as our fathers in charge of the New World Order and other unpopular ideas, where I spoke about Isaiah 53 being about the servant Israel, not about Yehoshua in particular, but about the whole group of Israel. So please see that video if you haven't before. Um, it really does make a difference. And um, remember to read Ezekiel 36, where it talks about the restoration of Israel, because that has not happened yet, and it will happen. And the whole nations are going to be shocked and in awe, because he's not restoring them for their sakes. He's restoring them to show those who will not keep the commandments how amazing he truly is. So he's going to use Israel, all of Israel, um, to prove to the heathens that the Ten Commandments is the way to life, basically. And he's doing it for his sake, not for anybody else's sake. But my main point here is in Isaiah 49, it talks about how Israel is what's being talked about, you say, and he said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel. So we see that the person speaking is Israel. And it says, um, he, speaking of Yahweh, hath made my, speaking of Israel, mouth like a sharp sword. So the sword comes out of people's mouths when they speak. And that is a weapon. He says, in my, in his quiver hath he hid me. And so that's like, you know, an arrow hidden in a quiver that you're going to pull out and shoot. Um, to destroy the world, basically. A quiver is where you would have your arrows, and the arrows are meant for destruction. And so, of course, we see that in Hebrews, it talks about the word of God that is coming out of people's mouths um, being sharper than any double-edged sword, which, again, is another weapon. And here, the term is macharian. And there's a reason I bring this up because the word sword is used another time, and it's a different word. So here, it just means sword. It says properly a slaughter knife, a short sword or, dag short sword or dagger, mainly used for stabbing, figuratively, an instrument for exacting retribution. So it's a sword, but it says that it, the word of Elohim is living and active. It's you know, the word is our Elohim. The word is always. It is not something that has been created or, you know, um, it's not a person. You know, it is living. It's how he speaks to us. And he's always been speaking to us. And um, it says it's sharper than the double-edged sword. So the word is not exactly a sword. It's even sharper than that sword. It destroys even greater than that sword. But it's something that's spoken. A word is something that is spoken. It's not a person. It's not a weapon per se. This is like personification basically of the word when people talk about it being a person. You know, it's not really a person. It's something that's being spoken by people like Israel. And it pierces to the dividing soul and spirit. And you can see my video on the daemons from the Gnostic view of daemons. And I discuss the difference between soul and spirit, where I talk about the soul being something that is killed, uh, the soul that's in it that shall die, and the spirit going back to Elohim who gave it. So we know that when you die, your spirit goes back to Elohim who gave it. So the spirit is everlasting and eternal, but the soul is something that has to die. And the soul is basically a reference to your sin nature. What It's not really a nature, because you can get rid of it. You can kill your soul when you die to your sin and get reborn of the spirit of our Father um, when you're begotten of him and born again. So there is a difference between the soul and the spirit. So do see that video on the demons if you don't know what I'm talking about there. Um, but the... Word of Elohim judges our thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there's nothing hidden from his sight. And so he's always 
judging us currently, we're condemned already, as the scriptures say. But by following after Yehoshua, uh, there's no more condemnation for us because when we stop sinning, there's nothing to condemn anymore. Another reference to the word in Jeremiah 23, verse 29, uh, I'll start with 28. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my, tr my word in truth. See, you're speaking his word. It's not like a person. You don't just speak out a person. You're speaking his word. You're speaking what he wants you to convey to people because he puts his words in our mouth. All right. Verse uh, 28. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares Yahweh? Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. And so in Jeremiah 1 verse 9, it talks about um, Yahweh putting words into Jeremiah's mouth to speak. Verse 9, Then Yahweh stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and Yahweh said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So once again, we see that Yahweh puts his words into his prophet's mouths. And this happens a lot. This is why Yehoshua was called a prophet. Because in Acts 3.22, it goes back to Deuteronomy, where, you know, in reference to Yehoshua. I'll click on Deuteronomy here. Um... King James Version. Where's the King James? Right. Deuteronomy 18. Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. When it says raise up, that means he's going to have somebody be born and grow and then that person will speak for him so like jeremiah was raised up to be a prophet and so was yehoshua he was raised up from birth to be a prophet it doesn't mean that yahweh is going to come down and you know be a prophet himself speaking for himself that doesn't make any sense as you will see here because they wanted to not hear from yahweh anymore if if yehoshua was yahweh then he wasn't keeping his promise here of saying that he was going to use a prophet to speak for him instead of speaking to them himself. All right, verse 15 again. Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye, ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desiredest of Yahweh thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God. Neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And Yahweh said unto me, They have spoken well that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, or character as I mentioned, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So, anyway, the, the word of God is something that he puts into his prophet's mouth. And we saw in Ezekiel that he does that when the Spirit comes into them. And, as I mentioned in a previous video, we are Christ, we are anointed by the Holy Spirit, and we're, we have his word inside of us. So, you know, people kind of don't realize that they're supposed to be prophets. They're supposed to be speaking his words and doing his actions in the world because we are the body of Christ. We are supposed to be co-heirs with Christ, according to scripture. But because of this doctrine of the Trinity, people don't think that they can be co-heirs with Christ. They think that they are lower than him and that they're not supposed to do the same thing that he did. But, you know, the more and more we stop sinning, the more and more we become perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect, like we were told to do, 
the more we will be able to hear from him and know exactly what he wants done and said. Also in Numbers 23 verse 5 it says, Then Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and you shall speak thus. So once again we see that Yahweh puts words into people's mouths to speak for him. And like I said in Ezekiel, it's done through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that comes upon us, and we know what to say. Um, in Ephesians 5 verse 26, it talks about um, husbands loving their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, to sanctify her for the church, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And of course, um, to present her to himself as a glorious church without stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. Once again, we see that the word is connected to getting us holy and blameless through washing. So the Holy Spirit is what convicts us of our sin. And so this is why I do believe the Holy Spirit is the word that cleanses us and gets us holy. That's why it's called the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist spirit is against being anointed and will keep you just like the world. But the Holy Spirit gets us holy and set apart from the world. Alright, so remember that the word of God is likened to a sword and to fire. In Revelation 1 verse 16, it's a vision of Yehoshua. It says, He held in his right hand seven stars, and a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was like the sun shining at its brightest. And so, this is where I'm going to get into the sword part. But you can see that the sharp double-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. And we know that the word of God is the double-edged sword. And it you know, our father puts his words into people's mouths. So, yeah, when you see Yehoshua, he's speaking our father's words. He speaks them. Um, you know, people get this confused and they think that Yehoshua is the word of God. And the reason is because he speaks the word of God. It comes out of his mouth, just like all the prophets spoke the word of God. And, you know, but the difference with Yehoshua was that that's all he spoke because he says he has not spoken of himself. He only speaks what he was commanded to. So some of the prophets in the past may have spoken of themselves. They may have said things that they were just thinking and then they would say, you know, thus says Yahweh and then they'd go into something that they were told to say. But Yehoshua was speaking for Yahweh his whole life, you know, whenever he was talking with people. I think it was probably more when he was anointed at his baptism, but, um, you know, I'm not going to get into that. But basically, everything he said was from Yahweh because he was there for a purpose. He was there to speak Yahweh's words to people. And so here, the words that he speaks are seen as a double-edged sword. And here's where I'm going to look up the word sword, because it doesn't just mean sword. This is a different Greek word. It's a romphea. And it says the short definition is a sword or a piercing grief. Okay, so it also could be a scimitar and everything, but you see that it's piercing grief and even war there. I'll uh, scroll down here. Okay, um, a figure for extreme anguish shall fill, pierce, as it were, thy soul. So once again, we see that it's a piercing of the soul, and that's what the word for sword is. It's not just the word sword that's being used when describing Yehoshua, as we saw that the word was even stronger than a sword, a general sword. A, a general sword. It's even stronger than that. And then when Yehoshua is speaking it, they use this word that talks about it being piercing uh, and a sword. But it's a different connotation. It's even sharper than just a sword. But it's something he's speaking. It's coming out of his mouth. It's symbolic language. Once again, in Revelation 19, this time, chap uh, chapter 19, verse 15, and from his mouth proceeds a sharp sword. And this is that piercing grief word again. 
with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Elohim, the Almighty. So, once again, um, he has the sword coming out of his mouth. It's not that he's holding a sword with his hand. He's speaking the word of Elohim. That's how he's going to strike down the nations. Um, the word strike here. Let's see. Says smite or strike with a sword, smite to death or afflict. So it can mean uh, to death, uh, to slay. But here's the thing. He's slaying with his words. It's something that he's speaking. It's not something that he is using a physical sword in his hand. It's something he's speaking. Like in Jeremiah, when it talks about his word being like fire or a hammer which shatters a rock. You know, it's not a literal hammer. It's, you know, just something that can break stone. And in this case, it might mean the stony heart where it talks about where we have to circumcise our heart um, and give us, he gives us a heart of flesh instead. So that's how the word of Elohim works. It talks about people having their heart circumcised and our father giving them a heart of flesh in the last days. And he does that through his word. And when they are going from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, then they are dying to their sin. Okay, so they're killing themselves um, spiritually speaking. They're not dying, you know, physically. They're dying spiritually to their sin. And then they're being reborn or begotten again of our Elohim when his Holy Spirit comes into their heart, gives them a heart of flesh, and they start following the Holy Spirit, which gets them holy and without sin. I wrote this on Facebook. Uh, we are told to repent from our sin and to die to it and be born again of our Elohim. When we repent of our sin, we have died the spiritual death. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, the seed of Elohim, we are born of him spiritually. We experience the spiritual death to sin before being spiritually born to Elohim if we are repentant. Those who are unrepentant die to their physical death first. The second death in the lake of fire is when they die to their sin spiritually. That's why it only lasts for an age, not for forever. We withstood our spiritual death and so can they. So you see that we're first born physically, and if you're unrepentant, you will die physically first. And then you will die spiritually in the lake of fire and be born again spiritually. If you are repentant, you're born first, physically born, and then you die spiritually, get born again, and then you die your physical death. You don't have to die a spiritual death again. You don't need the second death because you already completed it. All right. Okay. So my point here is that the word of Elohim will kill people spiritually for the second death. And I'm debating whether or not, you know, I've got a theory that we're already in the lake of fire and people are already being tormented because Yehoshua said he came to people that were already condemned. And we can see a lot of people are being tortured by their sin right now as in they're slaves to sin and the demons are having at it right now. Um, but you don't have to believe that part. But my point is that, you know, when we die spiritually, it is called a death. I had a dream in May uh, 2015, and that I say that our father woke me up with it. And it was a dream about aliens, but I found out afterwards, this is what he wanted me to res research um, on it is that it was actually demons pretending to be aliens. But that's how he was speaking to me. Anyway, they were enslaving people. They were very, very tiny, as in totally insignificant. Like, we can totally um, beat them if we wanted to, but we let them rule over us, just like when people uh, sin, 
they are giving the demons the right to rule over them, as I talk about in my Slaves Under the Law of the Angels. So people are slaves to these demons. And then in my dream, I was praying for rain, like from Noah. And I got everybody else with me to pray for rain. We were hiding out. And um, then, you know, Father sent rain. And the people who had these collars on from the demons, the aliens, they got electrocuted and they died. And I was always wondering, I always felt bad, you know, for them dying. And then I realized that, oh, the rain is like baptism waters. You know, um, they are dying to their sin and they're being baptized and born again, spiritually speaking. That's when I woke up anyway, so I never got to see the end of that. But I get it now. Um, when you are freed, when our Father actually sends the rain, the latter rain, uh, people will be free from their sin. They will die that spiritual death. It's a type of slaying. You know, um, people are going to be killed, but it's spiritually, in my opinion, that that's what the scriptures seem to say to me. And another thing is, of course, in the armor of God, it talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So once again, we see that the Hebrews of the time, the Israelites, they all believed that the spirit was how our father spoke to them and that it was likened to a sword. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, it says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus Yahushua will slay with the breath of his mouth and abolish the majesty of his arrival. So once again, we see that his mouth is how he will slay people, that they will be taken away of their life. But, you know, once again, this is a spiritual thing. People die to their sin and, you know, it, it's coming from his mouth. It's not, and it's coming from his breath, which I'm going to look into here, but it's not coming from a sword. He's slaying them not with a sword, but with his mouth. And so the word for breath is pneuma, and it implies breath or spirit. And we can see the same thing happen in the Hebrew. The word for breath or spirit is the same word. It's not something that is, um, separate. In our language, we don't normally equate uh, the Holy Spirit with something you breathe. But, you know, there's also a point in the scriptures where it says that he breathed on the disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit. You know, it is a thing that is connected in their, you know, language, basically. And it says here, the most frequent translation of Numa is spirit. Only the context, however, determines which sense is meant. So, you know, you have to wonder why they translated this as breath when it talks about the breath of his mouth as how they're going to be slayed. Because as I've shown in this video, you know, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God that comes out of his mouth. And so it's the Spirit of his mouth that is going to abolish and slay. And once again, we see that that's the word of God. The word of Elohim is put into his mouth for him to speak. It, you know, you can't just speak somebody to death unless you're speaking, um, you know, the way to life. And that's what he did. He told everybody how to get eternal life and how to not die because the wages of sin is death. And he told people how to stop sinning. That's what he came to do. And if you are explaining to somebody else how to stop sinning, you are helping them kill their sin. They kill their self, their soul, the soul that sinneth it shall die. That's the point. You're supposed to kill the soul that's sinning so that you can be born of the spirit and be holy that is set apart and stop sinning. Be perfect as our father in heaven is perfect. So the word of Elohim is what kills people um, from their sin. That is the point here. The reason I even thought to do this video is because somebody shared with me this parable, and I've seen it before. It's actually been described as a Mandela effect by some who just cannot accept the idea that Yehoshua would slay people 
Um, but it's not even him, actually. So I guess I'll read it. Um, so just pay attention here. Uh, you've heard the story before. It's also seen in Matthew, but the last line is not in Matthew, even though there's a parallel account. So I'll discuss this. All right, verse uh, Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So remember that this is a parable. It's not something that's actually happening. It's a parable for what will happen. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So, yes, it is, you know, about him, the king, who is going to the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, and he's going to return to us. Verse 13, And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, and he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an asture man, thou takest up what thou layest not down, and reapest what thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an asture man, taking up what I had laid down, what I had not laid down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So, um, we see that this is a parable that is describing Yehoshua. It's a parable, but it is describing Yehoshua and us, his servants. And so he's giving everybody a pound. He's giving us all talents to use and gain more people for the kingdom. And it talks about where it says he reapest what he didn't sow, where it's saying that Yehoshua is not actually the one who was going to sow the seeds. He's giving us the pounds or the talents to sow seeds for him. So it's talking about how he's not the one who's doing it. We are the ones who is doing it, but that he is going to be reaping it, where they're saying that he's reaping what we did for him. And so they're saying that he's an asture man. Click on that. Or a harsh man, withdrawing what he did not deposit and reaping what he did not sow. So he's using us to um, get him interest, basically. That's why he's talking about the bank and interest and everything. He gives us something to work with. And we go out and we are the sowers of the word, as I spoke about uh, previously in a different video. We are the sowers of the word and we are supposed to reap a bountiful harvest for him. He is coming back to see what we did for him. And so, of course, you know, there's the one who's afraid and he just doesn't do anything with this talent or this minus or whatever. He doesn't do anything with the money. And, you know, Yoshua is like, well, why didn't you even put it in the bank? You know, why couldn't you do anything with it that there would be any kind of interest on it? And uh, he said he was afraid. And so, you know, um, it's talking about how his people, his own citizens, hated him. 
and that's really sad, but that's what's going on. His own citizens don't want to actually uh, sow for him uh, their king. So anyway, that's the point of the parable, but this part at the end, it talks about how he's talking to his citizens. He's talking to his people, and it says, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So in this, he's not talking about him slaying them. He's telling his citizens, to slay those enemies before Yehoshua. So how are they slaying them? Well, people are talking about this being a Mandela effect because they're saying that Yehoshua would never ask us to kill for him. And, I mean, we see that in Luke uh, 22 where it talks about how Yehoshua is saying no more to the cutting off of a right ear of the high priest. He's saying no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. You know, he's not asking for us to physically slay people. And there are people out there who understand that he's not asking us to slay people uh, by murdering them. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about, you know, slaying them with the word. Um, in Matthew 25 is the parallel account, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can read it yourself. But at the end of it, it says, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And these, you know, titles were not there originally. It just goes into the next part where it says, The Son of Man, speaking of Yehoshua, will come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. And he'll sit, sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set his sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. So the goats are the ones who are weeping and gnashing the teeth. Those are the ones who don't, um, you know, help the sick and the, pr the people in prison and all that stuff you can see here. It's definitely a matter of works um, for who gets described as a goat versus a sheep. Um, and then it says, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. And this is, of course, age-long punishment, not everlasting, if you just look at the words, but uh, the righteous into life eternal. So you see that those in everlasting punishment are those who are weeping and gnashing their teeth, and they are the ones outside of the kingdom in Revelation. Verse 22, 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. They're the ones who are outside of the city. They are not allowed into the kingdom because they are not keeping the commandments. So how do they get inside the kingdom? These are the people who are going to be ashes beneath our feet. How do they become ashes? Well, they have to die. So, you know, the idea here is that they're spiritually going to die. That's how we're going to be doing it. We'll, we will be in the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, by keeping his commandments. And then he wants us to slay them in Luke 19. So when he comes back, we will be in the kingdom, but his enemies, um, which didn't want him to reign over them, were supposed to bring hither before him and slay them. How do we do that? The same way he slays people, the word is the double-edged sword that comes out of his mouth that kills. It kills people. It kills their sin, the soul, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And they become ashes under our feet, and they get born again. And that would be how they would enter the kingdom. Because when they're born again of our Elohim, they're not going to have any sin. And, you know, we are supposed to be kings and priests. We're supposed to be reigning over them. How can we be kings and priests if our kingdom is built with just us and Yehoshua? There would be nobody to reign over. 
So how are we going to be a king over somebody else? How are we going to be over these kingdoms? It talks about, you know, the good servant being, having authority over 10 cities and another good servant over five cities, depending on how much they've done. They would be reigning over cities. What is there to reign over if it's just us and Yehoshua? There have to be other people to reign over. So, well, how would you do that? Well, you would slay those people that are outside of the kingdom. You would get them to stop sinning. They would die to their sin. They die. You slay them. And then they would be born again of Elohim. And when they're born again, they still have, you know, things that they're trying to get rid of in their life. Well, you would guide them. You would have authority over them and you know keep them in line you'd be their priest a king and priest and that's how there would be people in the cities that would be ruled over by you so i'm just going to read a few more verses that sort of tie this up with the breath or the spirit as you can see in job 4 9 it says by the breath of god they perish and by the blast of his anger they come to an end Word for breath here is neshama, which also is described as spirit. Once again, uh, this is not just um, breath. Uh, it says breath of God is hot and hot wind kindling a flame, as destroying wind, as cold wind producing ice. Breath of man, it says, as breathed in by God, it is God's breath in man. You know, he gave us his spirit when he breathed his life into us. Um, it says every breathing thing, uh, the spirit of man is a lamp of, you see, uh, it's connected to spirit. Here from Nisham, a puff, wind, angry, or vital breath, divine inspiration, intellect, or concretely an animal last that breatheth inspiration soul spirit so you can see that the spirit and breath and blast and you know how our father uh, uses it for destroying sometimes a destroying wind or a flame such as brim, brimstone you know um, it's used and it says that's how people perish uh, the breath um, blast of his anger that might be the same word it says it's a different word, it's ruach, but it still means breath, wind, spirit. Just different, you know. Um, same idea there. And uh, we talked about this Second Thessalonians. The breath of his mouth is how people will be slayed. Um, Exodus 15, 8. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. This is speaking of the water um, when they crossed the Red Sea. And it was... By the blast, the breath, the wind. It's the same word here. Um, Job 15.30, it says, He will not escape from darkness. The flame will wither his shoots, and by breath of his mouth he will go away. Once again, we see the breath of the spirit out of the mouth being connected to flames and uh, withering shoots. So that's how people can be turned to ashes by the spirit coming out of the mouth the word of Elohim that's being spoken. It's all connected. This is very scriptural, even though most people don't really look into the scriptures concerning the word of God. It's not a book. It is a spirit that's living inside of us. Job 40, 11. I'm just looking here. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. This is just about that. That's not about the spirit. All right. Um, there's another one I wanted. Okay. Isaiah 30, verse 33, it says, For Topheth has long been ready, indeed it has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire, with plenty of wood, the breath of Yahweh, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. So once again, we see that the brimstone, where people will be tortured, um, partaking the mark of the beast, uh, it most likely is the breath of Yahweh. It's the Holy Spirit that's convicting. We have to be purified like, you know, tried in the fire. Um, it's not about tormenting, you know, somebody in fire forever and ever. That's not what it's about. It's about getting purified through the Holy Spirit 
the breath or the spirit of Yahweh like brimstone. There's another verse where it talks about um, a burning coal uh, that the angel uses to purify. Um, it says your sin is forgiven because he was touched on the lips, Isaiah 6, 7, um, by the burning coal from the angel. So you can see that the coal, the brimstone, that stuff is purification. I don't remember if I mentioned this in this video, but Isaiah 11, 4, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness to the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Once again, something that's coming out of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So once again, you know, breath, spirit, lips coming out of the mouth. Um, where is it talking about the rod? Where is it Strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And the rod, it says staff, or club, scepter, um, or tribes. So, anyway, he's uh, speaking it. This is all about, you know, being a king over somebody by speaking things, uh, and that's how you slay the wicked. And it says, in righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his wings. So, um, this is not about physical slaying. This is about something that's being spoken. In the Isaiah 47, the grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of Yahweh blows upon it, surely the people are grass. So, um, we are related to grass in this description, as in the breath of Yahweh can blow upon us, and we can fade or wither. Um, the soul that sinneth, it shall die, because the word of God, the Holy Spirit, will kill that sin, that soul that sinneth, and we will be born again of our Elohim, so that we will all be children of our Elohim in spirit. And that is the whole point of the scriptures. Uh, Yehoshua is coming back, and he's going to use us to slay people with the word of Elohim by what we speak because we're going to guide people to stop sinning and that is my opinion based on what the scriptures really say after much study so I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you something to think about thanks for listening and Shalom